Finland Saga Season 2, Episode 13. We left off with a pretty big bombshell that Canute and also every other character is on the way to Slave Island. Episode 13, Dark Clouds. Uh, what is this? Who is this? The warrior tapestry burns symbolically. <laughs> Amazing he made it that far. I don't think he's gonna make it. This guy has, like, super villain written all over him. Every shot of this guy, every detail. Another slave. Didn't have quite the pleasant experience Thorfinn and Aner had. Might have trouble working with one leg. Somehow I don't think it's working out for him. Yeah. Who is this guy? Who, who are you? God help whoever is holding whatever woman he's talking about. This man is possessed. Why do I feel like this guy's story could have been a whole show? Oh, it's a new opening. Yeah, we're halfway through, right? Uh, it's a new character, right? I'm not crazy. Wasn't expecting a new character at this point. I don't know what to make of these, these images, but this is awesome. Olmar, maybe Olmar finds God. Dude, this guy is something else. What an introduction, for real. Man, Thorfinn has his work cut out for him in this world. God bless. Thor's waving from the opposite shore. Whoa. That was amazing. I wonder what this effigy thing we keep seeing is. There is that lamb in Thorfinn's dream, right? Lots of sacrificial images. Also curious about the butterflies. This opening is honestly phenomenal. It's so good. The first half of season one's opening was great, but something really magical about this one as well. Also crazy to think that in all this chaos, <laughs> Thorfinn is kind of the voice of reason. Though he's still super untested. Uh, yeah, I was thinking. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't even think it was so terrible if either one of them chose to stay here. I don't think it's their destiny, right? especially not Dorfin's destiny. And in that sense, the negative would be hiding from that, hiding from the world. That being said, it's not that bad here. It's Vinland Saga, so it could be a hell of a lot worse. But then again, life here is not going to last long. Plus, there's Arnheed. <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> Honestly, it's relatable. I know you should get out of the world and just meet other women. There's a lot of them. He's just been stuck here forever. These three, I feel, are about to get really close, given the threat that's coming. What's going on? This could be the end. This could be the end of peace. They don't even know that a lot of the decisions are going to be made for them. He's alive. Knowing him, he <laughs> might want to go back to work. Yeah, 
there's something so badass about Sverkel. The fact that he just feels so self-contained that he found what he needed. He's free, right? This was originally his farm. But he's kind of the like the maximization of the beauty that we've seen in Dwarfin and Aner's endeavors. Just the connection to life and the world through work, hard work, and hard work at growing something at that. <laughs> it's the first time with food. Oh, he's gonna love that. He's gonna love being treated like a feeble old man. That could be worse, right? He's <laughs> such a great pairing. Yeah, obviously. He's got his pride. <laughs> but through all of it though, I feel like in these scenes, despite his gruffness, there's this feeling that he enjoys it. He likes the company of people that he likes or people he respects. He's still got a lot of spirit. <laughs> He's alright. <laughs> He's really not. Yeah, it's just kind of a gruff exterior. But he's solid. He's just kind of like a no BS grandpa. But he's got his wisdom. Yeah, probably, probably his kettle's gone. Yeah. Maybe his kettle's gone. We can just chill in the house. And because we have food. Oh, enjoy it, guys. <laughs> enjoy it, please. Oh. Thorfinn has a gut sense something's coming. Oh, it's, it's coming together. Interesting moment for Snake. This is such an interesting setup because we know this big military threat is coming way more than Snake's force can handle. Now we have this escaped Jesus slave on the way and there was something very, very villainous about his appearance, his entrance. Then again, it didn't feel like just cruelty. It felt like wrath based on his experiences. That was rage that was built over a long period of injustices. One thing I know for a fact in a very limited way compared to this is that your environment can become in your mind the whole world. Like, if you live in a bubble and you experience one thing or one set of things for long enough, you over-extrapolate, project that into all of humanity, all of reality, and you think those are the values of the world. Even if you live freely, even if you live in a way where you can encounter many different things, since we all basically live in some sort of a routine way or in some kind of bubble, and because the people we interact with regularly have to in some way be connected enough to us that we can relate and have relationships, we underestimate the extent to which our world and the reflections we see of the world are limited. I would guess that for almost everyone, the, the world we have of what the world is, is perhaps largely a reflection of what we are and what we've experienced so far, as opposed to the actual full truth, which is so large it's hard to fully understand. I say that to say that that's his world. He's chosen violence. Isn't there a possibility that he arrives here somehow and is given a place as an ally? Especially given the fact that there are definitely people here who can relate to him. Right, right. Cornered is a good word for it. He's also been stabbed. He's walking through the earth like some kind of phantom. I mean, if he's coming here, he came to the right place, maybe. Depending on what happens. It's been shown clearly that Snake doesn't care about slave or not slave. Neither does Sverkel. Thorfinn and Aenor, obviously, will not be hostile to him based on that point. Kettle himself has his flaws, but he's not unkind to slaves. Could be a trap. They are just not stealthy at all. I see they went to the Avatar school of sneaking around. I don't think he's in the in the thing. I don't think he's in the pouch or the hood. I actually, I can't believe I'm saying this. I feel bad for this guy having to deal with these two. This is, wow, wow. I've never seen cover blown so badly in my life. I guess it wasn't a trap and it didn't need to be. 
Couldn't have happened to nicer guys. Oh, dear. He's not going to trust anyone, this dude. He's just going to assume everyone's hostile. Because everyone's been hostile, probably. Oi, Torvinho. Thorfinn's entered his philosophy stage of life. He's getting lost in thought. Thorfinn's just mind is awakening. Thorfinn's <laughs> <laughs> like our tax collectors being put forth here as ultimate evil. No pressure. Mistakes <laughs> over it. <laughs> so I'm just here reading. He wants to go back to work. This man is committed. It's not looking too great. It's amazing and a testament to the show, I think, that a scene in which people are reading the Bible can be riveting. But it's perfect. It feels so perfect for Thorfinn. You could have read him this same passage a billion times before, and it would have meant nothing. He would have just not had any ears attuned to it. But it's one of those things, I've experienced this quite often, when you have an insight or you have a new thought or a revelation and then suddenly that information is everywhere and you realize it's been there the whole time. It's just that you didn't have the capacity for it yet. And there are levels to that too. I mean, you, you can understand something at a certain level. You can read a passage and be like, okay, I get this, I get what it means. But with really great insights, there are levels and the more you go into it, the more you grow, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Thorfinn is just primed right now for anything, anything of substance that has to do with his quest for what it means to be on earth how to make sense of suffering and the idea of there are no enemies the love your enemies thing is such a big thing to talk about i think i'll put it at the end of the video yeah they, they're really close weird how they, they become like a little family even maybe even more than circle and kettle i don't think his motivations are really that mercenary i saw the way he panicked when circle didn't show up for dinner I'm enjoying this piece so much, I don't want it to end. Nope. Oh, two of them survived. What a relief. Oh! Oh, they- Oh, it's her! This is a whole, whole big monkey wrench. Every shot of this guy is just amazing. <laughs> Looks like a legend. He's just born a legend. You tell the author loves him. Oh, sorry, Hainer. That's what I call a sticky situation. I don't need to be pulled in three directions. I was expecting a lot of things to befall this land this episode, but a love triangle wasn't one of them. This at least sounds a little bit more uplifting than time and time again, my hope is gone. War is coming. But so is Leaf. Honestly, who would have thought? Who would have thought watching Vinland Saga Season 1 that <laughs> it would become this heartfelt, that it was a prologue to something this beautiful? That I would be enjoying the slice of life moments. You know, their little moments of peace on the farm where they're chopping wood together and just talking about life, reading the Bible. I honestly never would have guessed, but I'm grateful for it. I really wasn't expecting the entrance of this character, but wow, what an introduction. He just oozes cool out of every pore. He's super violent, which is against some of the themes we've been building in the show, but at the same time, I don't want to be too quick to judge him and his character and his motivations because we don't know what he's been through, or we can guess what he's been through, and it's terrible. And then he does all this and breaks out to rescue his wife, which is pretty amazing. And the whole time he looks like Viking Jesus. Einar's got a lot of competition. Wonder how Arnhead feels about this. There's definitely a story there. Probably captured together and sold separately, but who knows how much time has passed and what, what that means, what that changes. I also love that even without that much dialogue, we can feel how much Thorfinn is changing. He feels happier. He feels gentle. He feels open in a state of spiritual expansion. And it's such a great touch having this kind of odd crew, you know, Snake, Sverkel, Aner, Thorfinn, Arnheed, find something like a home on this farm where they all have just enough in common. They have something in common that 
makes their interactions, makes their living together pleasant. I can't specify exactly what that thing is, but there's this common element of just this decency that they have on some level, despite their idiosyncrasies, their foibles, their histories. I guess they each have been through enough or have found meaning enough in their pursuits that a lot of the superficialities, pettiness, are stripped away. And so their labels, their status, and their differences are kind of just superfluous to what they actually are and what they enjoy, which just seems to be each other's company and food. They found a pocket for themselves in a world where this feels kind of rare. Circle feels to me like the patriarch of that. And in many ways, there's more of a bond here, more of a family bond than there is with his own kids and grandkids. And I think actually that's connected to the idea that they were exploring in the Bible of loving your enemies. I mean, this idea is so big. There are just infinite things you could say about this idea. First is the idea that to love your enemy is to love yourself. To know your enemy is to love yourself. The reason for that is there are just certain functions of humanity that we all share. What differs is not the, the base, the core, but rather the set of circumstances that we were dropped into and the experiences that we had from there. To focus on those outside superficialities, the, the outside result of the algorithm ignores the fact that the algorithm is the same. And to not understand why certain inputs can lead to certain outputs is to not understand the, the whole, the essence of what humanity is, which means one, there's probably a blind spot about how you yourself work. And two, you may have the very same weaknesses, the very same threat that you are experiencing or observing in others. In many cases, the things that are the most threatening about others, the people who catch our attention and invoke some kind of negative sentiment are reflections of important concepts for ourselves, important weaknesses for ourselves. An example of that that I've said many times in this series, in this season, is with Omar. You know, people who are strong naturally do not get provoked by others because they know their strength. Olmar's enemies only stand out to Olmar as enemies because of his own fear. I've had many experiences where I felt some kind of hatred or jealousy towards other people, only to later understand that they represented a threat to my worldview and the things I wanted, the things I coveted. And in many cases, realizing that helped it turn around to the point where those people became a complement to my life because they carried with them things I needed to learn and grow. And oftentimes, I also provided another side of the coin for them. I won't say all, but I think a lot of the differences, you know, thought differences, ideological differences, are what are very heavily focused on, but are not actually the core of the issue, the core of the problem, and not what we're actually seeking. What we're actually seeking is probably something like survival, following our biological imperatives, maximizing our lives and perhaps our spirits, but the issue comes when our view is so singular about what that means, due to just the vast complexity of the world and getting what we need out of life, that for safety, for security, and for just coherency of thought and finding patterns by which we can trust in to follow, we've come to lean too heavily on one mode of being, one mode of thinking, that does not capture the full truth, but allows us to live without this great uncertainty or the great chaos of all that could be and all that is. But nobody's an enemy in that struggle because it's all the same struggle. I think one of the challenges of being a, a biological creature is that there are two games happening at once. There's the immediate survival game, which is important. You know, that's that's God-given. That's nature-given. It's not nothing. It's not something to be totally ignored. We are animals. Life is important. Our survival is important. Protecting those around us is important. But then there's the other level of that, which is what is good for survival now, the short term, does not necessarily mean what's good for survival long term. I think that's where a lot of higher level human values come in. The purpose is to question the strength of the immediate biological survival in favor of the more long-term, more abstract, greater potential of humanity. So that means ignoring short-term gain, short-term survival, short-term pleasure for cultivating values that lead to that for the most people possible, which actually, if you think about it, is the best way to ensure individual survival. The two are connected. For example, selfishness. Selfishness is a powerful tool. If there is a group of people who is trying to divide scarce resources and one person has the initiative to just take those resources, then that person might actually do great, might do better, might be more prosperous in life. What happens though is that that then corrupts the rest. And now it is not advantageous to be charitable, be generous, to share with others. And so it devolves into selfishness for everyone. And that's when you have a collapse. You have no growth. You have no systemic development. Every man for himself. And that almost definitely leads to less for everyone and less chance of survival for each individual. It's this really tough, long war between the immediate instinctual biological and what is, I think, innately human, which is the long-term thinking. One thing I thought about is this might even explain that age-old question, why do good things happen to bad people if God exists? Well, it's because given the fact that there's scarcity, you need individuals, you need animals to have a survival instinct. You need to be in the system of evolution where to continue means to strive to continue. You, have, you need to have that imperative to continue. That actually can be a beautiful thing. It depends on the application. Obviously, we know that can be corrupted. Nevertheless, that part of us is natural and essential. It's part of the balance that has to be struck where there's so much raw potential in humanity and in nature, and there's so much that humanity is capable of. But to even start that, to get anywhere, you, you need to have that individuality. You need to have that drive to live. A separate but connected notion, I guess, is the idea of death and rebirth. That there needs to be death for growth. To grow the things that work, to grow the things that flourish, means, almost by definition, 
to be able to let go and dispense of the things that are corrupted. Long story short, all humanity is engaged in this struggle. But for each individual to see themselves as the ultimate goal, purpose, or endpoint of this potential weakens the ability of each individual to flourish in that same way. Or if not oneself, then one's offspring. One idea I've been thinking about on this topic is that you can maybe make a biological argument for this as well. Most human beings are, are basically just vehicles for, for genes, you know, for DNA. Individuals die, obviously, but if any organism is successful, what that means is passing on the genes. So the genes survive just through another host. That is really the, the crux of of the biological drive. And there's something really sacred about that. You're taking life that has been created from eons and eons ago, and you're continuing it. You're fighting the natural forces of death and decay, beating the natural state of, of atrophy through this synthesis of organic matter and the environment and human relationships to pass something on so that other people can go on to live lives and hopefully create and live to their full potential, etc. And a lot of things make sense in that light. You know, there's a reason why family has more instinctual priority than, than a stranger, than an outsider from another tribe, for example. There's a biological reason why even extended family, let's say, you know, an aunt and a nephew or uncle and a, and a nephew care about each other's well-being. It's because they're both caring the same DNA. They're both vehicles for that same life force. And so in a sense, my nephew, my niece's survival is my survival, if you're looking at it from a genetic perspective. But then there's that whole other level, right? There's the human rational level, the intellect, the soul. And this is kind of a weird concept, but that has a DNA of its own. Information creation is DNA-like. Because if I have an idea and I pass it to somebody else, is that not like passing of genes? Is that not a similar thing where from the universe, from organic matter, and from just the forces that be that govern the universe, something was created, some synthesis of information was created to create an idea or a concept that I can then pass on to somebody else for the future, despite the fact that my life is limited. And as someone who believes that the universe values, quote unquote, creation and potential, given the fact that things are growing, things are being created, things are developing, despite, like I said, the natural forces against that, the fact that things continue to be and change and develop, despite the fact that it seems it would, it would almost be inevitably easier for there to be nothing, perhaps the highest form of creation lies in that synthesis of ideas. Like every human as a unit contributing something, contributing some kind of life force, some kind of energy, some kind of idea, even if it's a bad idea, even if it's something negative, because that's all input into this growing collective understanding of the world and truth and progress, whether it be technological or, or philosophical or what have you, that that almost has to be something divine and God-given. And to focus solely on the, the individual and the life or death of someone and the perpetuation of DNA misses that whole other realm where we're all connected by a common DNA, which is the DNA of this, for lack of a better word, growth, a sort of collective consciousness that forms a whole. And I guess it's not that one is more important or bigger than the other, it's that there's a way in which the two can be harmonious. The higher the concept of shared humanity and shared vision, the greater the chance for the individual as well. Neither the biological nor the spiritual or any other elements are bad, unless they're used for the type of destruction that is wasteful and detracts from that growth, that is negative, that slips into the, the opposing forces of what I'm talking about, which would be decay, premature death, atrophy, moving backwards on whatever scale this is. And that's the connection, I think, to being perfect like me, being like God, because let's just take God as truth, God as what is, which almost certainly has to be good, because I mean, what is good otherwise? How do you even have a scale of good and bad if there isn't some kind of metric, broader metric on which to base it on? When you love your enemy, when you act in accordance with this kind of development and growth, this confluence of the, the biological need with the spiritual need, with with this higher level understanding of the connection that seems to be in greatest alignment with the infrastructure into which we were born and in which we play a vital part to quote attack on titan do you know who the real enemy is the answer of course is the enemy is is you but at the same time the enemy isn't you it's no one if there is an enemy it's in yourself it's the fact that all people have this potential and are connected in this way yet have the capacity for this evil as an offshoot as sort of a side effect of the survival mechanism that is essential for for carrying on this very thing and that system is perhaps the best one that could be because i mean it is right and you figure the universe has gone through a process of evolution and natural selection by itself. It's not just biological matter that goes through evolutionary processes, probably. And so this system seems to be the most sustainable for this development, for this growth, and it is therefore the challenge, and I would say responsibility of humanity to try to get as close to that as possible, to try to get as close to that truth as is possible given our, our limited brains, and to live in accordance with those principles, which in this Bible passage would be perfection. It would be God's image. I deeply apologize because I feel like this might end up just being a long word salad. It's a really complicated idea. It's hard to talk about. Way bigger than me. One thing I'll add that's relevant to the show is understanding that someone is not your enemy or loving your enemy doesn't mean tolerating everything your enemy does. It doesn't mean being okay with just death, I don't think. You can still fight for your ideals and what you believe in, but I think the more you carry the understanding of the commonality, the easier it is to get to what is actually right and to avoid the pitfalls and, av and avoid just becoming your enemy, right? Which is a, a thing you see all the time. How different are two warring people really? And that's the biggest challenge I foresee for Thorfinn because he's, he's onto something beautiful. He's onto something huge. 
and he's been there through experience, through lived experience, so it's rich. It's not just blind obedience to some kind of tenet or law. It's not blind obedience to the Bible. It's not blind obedience to Thor's. It's, he's ha he has an understanding of other people's humanity and his own and his own evil and can therefore understand why other people are evil and can love them for that, despite not loving the evil itself. But then there's very real threats. There is still evil. There are people who are out for destruction, who are on that negative side of that selfish spectrum. So how does he combat it? How does he stand for justice while balancing that deep understanding he has of other people? That state, I think, is like the most heroic state. I started season one by referring to the Thors as Jesus, and I think that's no accident. I mean, that's the level it takes. It takes that level of transcendence to be able to uphold your values, stand up for what you believe in while loving your enemies, while loving all people and doing only good.